So today I'd like to uh, uh, talk uh, I'll talk about um, uh, something that's very central to Buddhism, and that's the mind, because uh, you know the Buddhism really what the, what what the Buddha is addressing is the our, our minds and how to work with our minds, because their minds don't they very much determine our experience of life, whether it be happy or unhappy, and you see that very often, don't you? You see people. You know, uh, people in the same situation, you know, same maybe the same work situation or whatever, and their experience of that is totally different. One may be very happy, very content, satisfied, and at peace with it, and the other person can be going through hell, you know, in the same place. You know, so what is going on? You know, it's physically the same environment. So it really points to the, uh, the importance of the mind, developing the mind. And this is what the Buddha is addressing, even though, you know, uh, the body is important, isn't it? It's a vehicle for the mind, for our experience of life. So we have to look after the body. And also the body is a source of wisdom uh, for us, actually, because this is what pr uh, prompted, which actually propelled the Buddha to become the, or the Bodhisattva, he wasn't enlightened at that time, to become the Buddha because he wanted to address the issues of old age, sickness and death. This is to do with the body, the experience that we all have, all human beings, all animals, all beings actually have. And that propelled him, but and to develop the wisdom, that mental understanding of the world as it is, which brought peace and happiness to him and was enabled him to finish with a samsara, we call the worldly conditions. So today I'd like to start by uh, mentioning too that uh, uh, one of the very interesting things when you fly, I think most people have this experience actually, when you're in an aeroplane above the clouds and you just see above the clouds, what do you see? You see blue sky and then you see the clouds below you, if there are clouds. And it's really quite interesting that uh, this is a bit like the mind, the nature of the mind, the... Uh, the blue sky, the Buddha would say, is like the nature of the mind. And the, the clouds are like the conditions that come into the mind, like unhappiness, happiness, you know, sometimes defilements coming up, anger, envy, jealousy, sometimes very good qualities, loving kindness, uh, compassion, and uh, wisdom in the mind. So these things are in the mind. But the mind in itself, the Buddha was talking about, is, is uh, like the blue sky. And one of the uh, quotations that I like very much, and uh, I think most Buddhists, uh, especially from Sri Lanka, traditional Buddhist countries will know, is from the Dhammapada. And uh, I, I give you the English translation. Mind is the forerunner of all mental states. Mind is their chief. They are mind made. If with an impure mind one speaks or acts, suffering follows one like the wheel follows the foot of the ox. And then the second the verse, these are like the pairs we say. Mind is the forerunner of all mental states. Mind is their chief. They are mind made. If with a pure mind one speaks or acts, happiness follows like one's never departing shadow. So this is, this is making a really important point. It's like the sky, the mind is different from the, uh, the mental states, the emotions, the reactions that come up in our minds. And if that were not the case, if, if, if the mind and our mental states, you know, the anger, irritation, annoyance were one thing, would it be possible to change? Would it be possible to develop other qualities? And of course, you know, many people... They have this idea that, you know, these qual I'm an angry person, you know, this quality is almost like permanent for them. And if you have this idea, then how can you develop, you know, your, that's part of your personality, you know. <laughs> if, if one gets rid of that anger, who am I? You know, I'm no longer the angry person or the kind person, whatever it is. So this is very, as I was saying with the blue sky, it's pointing to the fact that the mind and these qualities that visit the mind uh, come and go. They're not permanent and they can change. And that is a really important point uh, to, 
to dwell on, actually, because, as I say, many people, I know in the West it's very common people to think these things are natural. They're there sort of almost permanently. You know, they come and go, of course, but, you know, they, they, uh, they are there as intrinsic part of the mind. They are there, they're sort of wired into the mind. And, of course, this is what the Buddha is saying. No, this is not the case. We can change. We can develop the mind. We can reduce our negative qualities. We can promote our positive qualities. And this is a very, uh, very, important, uh, very important point because it encourages. We know we can de deal with our negative qualities and develop the positive ones. And also the other thing that comes from this is really that, you know, um, if he's talking about karma, really, when he says, if we act with an impure mind, then uh, if we act or we speak with an impure mind, then the results of that are suffering. That, that's the results that come from that. Just like the ox with the wheels of the cart following behind the ox. It's just very natural consequence. So he's talking about karma of uh, our actions. And this... This is quite an important point because you see cause and effect. And sometimes people say, you know, I hear Buddhists, even in Sri Lanka, you know, people say, I don't believe in karma and rebirth, you know. And, uh, but I, I am amazed because I think you can see it in everyday life. You can see, you know, if you say or do something to a person that's very negative, you'll get something back, either from that person or later yourself, you'll feel... I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't. You'll feel regret, remorse. So you know, I think to me, I'm always surprised when people find it difficult to uh, accept karma because we see it in our everyday life. What you give out is what you get back. You know, what comes, uh, what goes around, comes around. This idea is very is inherent, and actually, it's the it's the basis in in a sense of uh, of science too, isn't it? Cause and effect cause and effect. There is a link. It's not just a random occurrence, <laughs> which, you know, would make life an incredibly difficult uh, process to negotiate. So that's very important uh, that we, we realize, you know, that we have, uh, that the states of mind that we, that come up from our mind uh, uh, generate this karma and, and that has a big effect on our lives here and now and in the future. So this is a, uh, a very important, important part that, that we can change them too. And I have a... So what is the most important thing in our lives? You know, is it the body? Is it the mind? <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious from, from what I'm talking about so far. The mind is what determines uh, determines our happiness, our unhappiness, our well-being in this life. And I often say to people, there are uh, many people can be have very attractive, beautiful bodies, handsome bodies, fa faces, and so on, but not handsome or beautiful minds. But a person with a beautiful mind, it doesn't matter what they look like. You really, their beauty shines through. It comes through from their minds. And this is this is uh, where. We should put most of our uh, attention, most of our energy, into developing the mind. And I talk about that a little bit later. But I tell a story now because otherwise it gets a, it gets a bit dull. <laughs> and uh, this is a story that some of you have heard here before because um, it's, a, it's a good story actually and illustrates the point very well uh, from the commentaries. Um, that, and it's a story of a man who had four wives do people remember this one? I think Sri Lankan people will know it very much because uh, a number of monks use it. And it's a very good, very good story. I like it very much. And it can be uh, interpreted on many different levels, so it's quite good. So this uh, man who had four wives, he was getting older, he was getting sick, getting frail, and he was coming to the point of uh, where he was going to pass away very shortly. He had, didn't have much time left. And so he was contemplating what to do, what to do. And he thought, if, when I die, I'll be lonely, you know. So I'd like to ask my, one of my, wife, my wives to come with me, come with me when I die. And so he thought this would be, you know, this would be no problem at all. They'd be, 
They'd shared their lives together, so of course they'd come with him after, after he died, come with him to the, whatever life he went to after that. And so his first, his first wife, the first wife he spoke to was the one that he was most fond of, and she, he'd only married her recently. She was young and beautiful. She was a bit like a model, and he really enjoyed her, her presence, having her around, and he showered a lot of uh, attention and money on her bought her all the best clothes from Paris and all these uh, um, fine perfumes or whatever and enjoyed being, you know, see other people seeing him with her. So he was very, very proud of this. And so he, he thought, well, I've spent a lot of time and attention and money uh, with my first, this is actually his last wife really, first this wife. And so uh, she will surely come with me. And so he asked her, you know, will you... Uh, darling, will you come with me when I die to, you know, so I won't be lonely after death, whatever life I go to. And uh, he was expecting, you know, yes, of course. And she said, no way. I won't even go one foot from you. When, when the body, when your body dies, I won't even go one foot away from it. And um, he was really taken back. He thought, well, that's um, ingratitude. He was really shaken that after all, everything I've done for you, you know, you won't come with me. So he uh, he was very, very disappointed, but he still had three other wives, so that was <laughs> another three opportunities. And so the second wife, he was very fond of her too because she was a very, uh, a very good manager, a homemaker. The home was really beautiful and she managed the family finances very well. And even helped with the business business side of things, and was a really really good manager. Made the home very uh, very comfortable, and uh, and also uh, looked after the family wealth and prosperity. And so he was very you know very uh, appreciative of her and uh, very proud of her as well. And so he asked her, you know, because she'd be great after after he died. She could organise things for him, so it'd be very comfortable wherever he went. This is the idea. And so he asked her, you know, darling, will you come with me And uh, when I die? And she said, no way. I will go as far as the gate <laughs> of, the, of the home. And that's as, as far as I will go. And so he was a bit, a bit taken aback, you know. I thought, my goodness, I've given so much to her. And, you know, we've been so close. And uh, she's uh, helped so much with the family fortunes. And so he thought, well, third wife, I'll ask her. And the third wife was a very good communicator. Maybe people would say networker. And she was very, very good with the family and bringing harmony to the family, to the relatives and to the friends as well. And also, also business associates and so on. So she was very good. People liked her. And uh, she was a good communicator, and he, she, she uh, always praised him, and he was very kind to him. And so he thought, yes, she'll make make a very good uh, uh, companion in this afterlife, and you know, people would, would be uh, a, he'd be surrounded by harmony and helpful people. And so he asks her, and she says, I think everyone knows. She says, Absolutely no, I'm not going. But I'll go to the grave, as far as the grave, and that's it. He was a bit taken aback again, but he thought, that's further. The first one, only one foot. Wouldn't even go a foot from the body, from where he died. The second one would go to the gate. The third one, at least go to the grave. That's quite good, isn't it? <laughs> Getting better, closer anyway, he thought. And then he had the fourth wife. And the fourth wife, he... he uh, it was the original wife, actually. She, he'd married her when he was young, she was young. And he had neglected her because she, didn't, she wasn't beautiful like the model. She wasn't a great um, organiser, manager like his, the, the other, one of the other wives. And she wasn't a great communicator, but she was always there. And she was a homebody and she was like a constant in the home, you know. She'd be always there and the sense of stability around her but you know he neglected her he didn't lavish much attention on her and um, you know she wasn't as well dressed <laughs> as some of his other wives and so he even though he would have I think much preferred some of the other wives to come he asked her anyway will you come with me darling when I uh, pass away and he was shocked because she said 
of course, of course I'll come with you when you pass away. He couldn't believe it. He thought, my goodness, the other three wives, there was no way. They were very definite. They couldn't go with him. And so he, he was very pleased that she would come with him. And uh, now the, this is a time for asking who the wives were. Do, do, I know some of you know who the wives were. Who was the first wife, the, the model, the, the super, the beautiful wife that he lavished so much attention on? Can you guess? That's a very, wow, I think some people have forgotten the story actually. <laughs> yes, Adrian's got it. It's the body. It symbolizes the body, our attachment to the body, how it looks, you know, giving it clothes, looking after it. Uh, we give a lot of attention to the body. If you look at our lives, our homes are built around the body. You know, we've got our bedrooms, dining rooms, we've got toilets, we've got everything, you know, for the body and the cars, and our offices, we've got chairs, we've got everything for the body, comfort for the body. And actually, if you look at most of our expenditure, it is on the body really on the body and uh, very little on the mind actually so so this this symbolizes the body but it also you can you can think of it too as being uh, like pleasure and pain too we 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 are caught up as it were in pleasure and pain we want pleasure of course pleasure of the body we want to have nice food and, um, nice uh, sounds uh, sights all these things and we want to avoid all cost pain. So this can also symbolize uh, pleasure, at least. This is what he's looking for, you know, the pleasure of this companion, this beautiful companion. Uh, and this and it also symbolizes the body. So it's a, this is where most of our attention goes. And so I think Adrian got that one, but who is who is wife number two, the, the manager? That's pretty easy, actually. <laughs> What, this is what people are mainly concerned with, where our main concerns are. And uh, I think ev everybody can relate to the body. I, I don't, does anybody disagree that, you know, no, no, I'm not interested in the body at all. <laughs> I sometimes forget to feed it. <laughs> no. And who is the second one, the manager, who makes the home uh, very, uh, very comfortable, organizes the finances and arranges everything? Any ideas? Very easy. Hmm? Finances, yes. Possessions. Uh, possessions and wealth, isn't it really? Possessions and wealth. So this is, this is something that people are very concerned with and they like to take with them, wouldn't they? they they'd like to, I don't know if they'd like to take their bodies with them so much, especially if it's an old body. <laughs> but, but, but certainly people like to take their possessions and wealth with them if they could. Of course they can't, they can't. So that's, a, that's the other side to it. And um, so possessions and wealth is, is, is a part of another way you can look at that and there's another way you can view this story is that it can be gain. We're all interested in gaining, getting, getting more money, getting more this. Sometimes people want to get better meditation, get jhanas, get to, uh, states of enlightenment. But, you know, so this is the getting type of mind. So this is a, what we call a worldly condition. And the Buddha said, this turns the world around. So you know, the, the idea of pleasure, it turns the, the world around, the body and pleasure. This is what people focus on. And also um, wealth, getting. This is what we also focus on. So these are the these are very central concerns. So what? Who is wife three? Does anybody have an idea? Wife three is a communicator, um, the uh, networker, par excellence. She's very good, and she makes people uh, happy. Hmm. Oh yes, that's uh, yes, yes can. Uh, for, that's the, they're both correct, actually, both, yes, yes, yes. Friends and family, because these are the most important, friends and family, most important people in our lives, aren't they? These are, these are people that we really count on for their friendship, for their support, and uh, we can really relate to them. 
So they're very important in our lives. But also, as, uh, as you, you said actually, that it also, at another level, it represents fame, wanting fame and status, wanting to avoid obscurity. It's also, in that scheme, praise and blame. It's praise because you, she says all the things he'd like to hear <laughs> and, and praises him. And, uh, and this drives our lives too, because we all want to make a mark in life. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know if everybody wants to be famous, um, you know, but uh, they certainly want to make a mark on, in, uh, in life so that they're remembered, you know, they're remembered. People say to me, they say, um, oh, you're on YouTube, you know, like this is some sort of fame or something. And I say to them, who isn't? <laughs> Who isn't on YouTube? <laughs> so I'm not, I don't think it's a particularly uh, famous thing, you know, to be on YouTube. So, so uh, but it, people do. We want to make a mark. We want to be remembered. And so this, this, this is where fame comes in, reputation, and wishing not to be, uh, um, you know, like uh, live in obscurity. So you see, sometimes you hear of people who do, you know, things like, um, you know, like, kill politicians, you know, like assassination of, uh, I think Robert Kennedy, I think it was. And um, they, the person who, who did that said, you know, that they wanted 15 seconds of fame or something. So people do anything, you know, to become famous, to make, make a mark. What a terrible mark. And in Buddhism, <laughs> we'd probably say, we'd get, in, get a, rather a surprise when he dies, you know, what happens after that having killed a person like that. So, so this is uh, the third wife. So the easy one now. Who's the fourth wife, the homely one that's always around? This should be really easy. Ah, uh, 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 there's two answers. That's good. Uh, I, got both. I think I heard the other one too. Mind, it's the mind. Yeah, the mind is, the mind travels on. It's really, in Buddhism we don't say it's, you know, the mind. We say it's a stream of consciousness. So it's moving on as it does through our lives. Like our mind when we were children is quite different from the mind we have now. And as it grows, or as we grow older, the body grows older. It changes all the time and moves on to another life. But it's also... Karma, as you say, that's one of the things we can take with us. That's the, the only uh, baggage allowed, actually. <laughs> so it's better to take, uh, you know, uh, good karma with you than the, the bad karma, to have the suitcase packed with all the good things you've done. And then that goes with us to the, to the next life. And we can condition the next existence, which is not such a surprise because the mind, the mind state that we have developed in this life will match the mind state of our rebirth. So if we've developed a lot of anger, uh, violence, um, uh, uh, harming others, maybe harming ourselves even, we go to a state where, that's, where similar conditions prevail. But if we've developed a mixed bag of, you know, sort of good states and sometimes not so good, then we go to a state that matches that, like a human state, you know, people... Human beings do good things, they do bad things, and uh, a mix. And if we do a lot of good, a lot of good things, then we say we go to a state which matches that. And this is a, like a, a divine beings, we call them, you know, heavenly beings, that where it's a very, uh, it's not such a physical world that we have more of a mental experience, mental body. So that we can take with us. But the important thing, as I mentioned, was number four wife. <laughs> And, and very similar to, to that, that man, how much time do we spend on that, on the mind? And indeed, you know, most people, if you ask them, what is the mind? They have no idea. And yet this is what is running our lives, the mind. I know Ajahn Brahm says, you know, uh, um, if you, he asks people to say, you know, put the hand up if they feel happy. And, or if they put up their right hand if they're happy and put up their left hand if they're unhappy and so on. And so he, and he's pointing to the fact, well, this is a mental experience. Is it real? Because in, the, in the, the world we live in today, you know, often the mind is not counted, uh, is not, uh, mm, in science, it's not regarded as something. Actually, it's just a byproduct of the brain. 
It's just something that arises from the brain, and when the brain dies, that's finished. But in Buddhism, we say, no, no, the mind is a separate thing that has its own life and will continue, uh, continue and have an effect in future lives. So this is, this is something that I think most people know, even though science uh, doesn't recognize the, the mind as such, most people know our experience is just coming from the mind all the time. Even though it's immaterial, you can't put your finger on it. Where is the mind? <laughs> you know, usually people will, you know, the emotions, they'll point to the heart, won't they? But So this is, uh, this is uh, really the, where we should put our investment. Because, you know, in, in these days you talk about investment, long-term investment, short-term investment. Well, the long-term investment is definitely the mind, even the short-term, actually. <laughs> because if you don't look after the mind, you won't be happy. You, you may have lots of uh, negative states that give rise to unhappiness. And uh, so the mind is, is a very, very important to develop, to put a lot of uh, emphasis on. And it leads, it also is important, brings up the point that it's not the things outside of us, the people, the, uh, the objects outside of us, the houses, the cars, whatever, that create our happiness and unhappiness. Sometimes people think that, don't they? We do. You know, we see our favorite food or whatever, or someone we like a lot, and then we get this happy feeling. But the feeling, where is it coming from? It's inside us. And as one of my teachers, Aikima, said, these things, people that we like, food we like, people we don't like, and so on, they're, they're only triggers. Where the work is, where, where it's all happening, where the source is, isn't it, is here, inside. Very, I'm pointing to the heart already. <laughs> inside us. It's not coming from outside. And that's a very, very important point. And where is that coming from, inside us? From the mind. And so this is why it's so important to develop the mind. I was only speaking to a friend last night on the telephone, and he was getting very angry and upset about a situation in his life. And I wanted to say to him, you know, that you don't have to uh, develop this. You don't have to get angry about it. You know, is it pleasant for you to develop this mind state? But he was thinking, oh, it's their fault, they're wrong, and possibly, Perhaps they are wrong. Maybe the, it is their fault. But then one still has to live with this anger, this upset, this irritation, you know. And is that pleasant? You know, it's not as if those, that person or whatever is forcing this anger into us. It's coming from us. It's coming from the mind. So this is where, you know, developing the mind is very, very important for us, for our happiness in life. Uh, and uh, to deal with these emotions, to not blame the triggers, not to bl blame the boss from hell or, or, the, or when somebody's having a bad hair day, as they used to say. I don't think they say it now. But um, just to realize the reaction's coming from me. And that is tank, takes the responsibility away. It's not giving power to the other person. You probably know that... Uh, Ajahn Brahm saying, don't allow anybody to, to control your happiness. And when we're blaming people outside, we're always we're giving them the power over us, really. But in actual fact, we are the ones that are creating the reaction. The feeling of anger, irritation, or happiness, or whatever it is, is coming from us. So this is where we can cultivate. We can, we can cultivate whatever we like. It's like a garden, isn't it? Our minds are like a garden. We can cultivate the beautiful flowers, fruit trees, uh, lovely trees, or we can cultivate the weeds. If we wish, we can cultivate the weeds and poisonous plants, whatever we like. Many people are cultivating poisonous plants. <laughs> this is anger, irritation, rage. You hear about it all the time. And uh, many, many um, terrible things in speech and in action. And... Some people are developing the, the flowers, the beautiful flowers, trees and fruit trees, that, which are the wholesome qualities. And then, you, then we get the benefit if we develop those, we enjoy them, we get happiness from them. The negative qualities, we don't get much out of them. What do people get out of the negative qualities? It's pretty easy. It's a sense of self, isn't it? You know, usually I'm right, I'm right, and because I'm right, 
then I'm entitled to be angry, annoyed, whatever, you know, with this person. So this is a support for that sense of self, but it's not of much value. It's like, a, it's like eating junk food all the time, or even worse than junk food, poison. <laughs> it's poison. So, so that's very... Uh, another story that I, I like to tell, because otherwise it gets uh, too much, is uh, and a story from Nasrudin. Uh, that I haven't told for a long time, so that's good. And uh, the story about Nasrudin is, Nasrudin was a Sufi. Do people know what a Sufi is? Is a form of Islam that's a very mystical form of Islam, a bit like Zen, actually. I like the stories very much, and uh, they're very, they're very um, funny too. Usually, very funny and have a very good point. And he was supposed to have been a person that existed in Turkey, um, I think about 800, 900 AD. So, and this story was one evening, Nasrudin was outside his house in the street under the light. And he was looking on the ground uh, very, very uh, uh, closely, looking around very intently, that's the word, intently looking around. And his neighbor saw him outside the house and he thought, oh, I wonder what he's looking for, you know. And he came out and asked him, Nasruddin, what are you looking for? And he said, my key, the key to the house. And he said, oh, oh all right, I help, I'll help you. And so, so he got down and had looked around. And he was, they searched everywhere. And um, he said, they, they couldn't find it. And the neighbor said to him, as people do, where did you lose it? Do you know where you lost it? I always think that's a wonderful question, isn't it? <laughs> it wouldn't be lost if you knew. <laughs> it's incredible. And he said, yes, yes, I know where I lost it. So Nazarudin was, was ahead of him, actually. And he said, well, where'd you lose it? Where, 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 where'd you drop it? Oh, inside the house. <laughs> he said, why are you looking outside the house? He said, the light is much better out here. <laughs> and that's what we do. We're looking outside the house, which is our mind, our mind, and we're looking outside into the world. We're looking for our happiness in the world. You know, we're looking for meaning in the world from uh, the, the sights, we, the nice sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touches. And this is, this is where most people are putting their attention. And the Buddha is saying to us, no, look inside. And all spiritual traditions, really, they do say that. And everybody knows that in a way, don't they? That happiness, wisdom is inside, not out there. It's really um, putting attention where, where we need to put the attention on the mind, on the inner qualities that we're developing. So this is a, it's a good, good story. I like the story of Nazareth. Many, many good stories. So, and one of the one of the sayings I like of the Buddha that makes this uh, um, emphasizes the the difference between the mind and the mind states. These mind and the mental states that we mentioned in in the first quotation, um, making that distinction between them uh, is is this quotation that I like very much. And uh, the Buddha says, "Luminous monks, luminous is like uh, full of light." like brilliant, radiant. And you may find this interesting. Luminous monks is the mind, but it is defiled by a visiting defilements. The uninstructed worldling, this is a person who doesn't know any, anything about the Buddha's teachings or a religious teaching or spiritual teaching, does not understand this as it really is. Therefore I say that for the uninstructed worldling, there is no development of the mind. And then he, Buddha always puts a negative case and then the positive case. It's really balanced, actually. The positive is he always leaves it to last because that's what you remember, <laughs> you want to remember. And he says, luminous uh, monks is this mind when it is freed from visiting uh, defilements. The instructed noble disciple understands this as it really is. Therefore I say that for the instructed noble disciple, there is development of the mind. So this is this is what I was saying about um, earlier, that if we think these negative qualities or, uh, are part and parcel of us, we can't get rid of them. We can't change them. Rhythm is probably the wrong word because it's quite, quite negative, forceful. Um, 
so we can't change. So it's very, very important to see that the essential quality of the mind the Buddha is pointing to is luminous, is radiant. And when people experience deep meditation, this is what they, they experience, you know, these bright lights in the mind, which can become nimittas, these signs, which can take them into even deeper meditation. And this is uh, the essential nature of the mind. Our job is, is to develop the good qualities reduce the negative so that this luminous, radiant quality is, becomes uh, more and more continuous, becomes more and more obvious to us. But it's good news because it means that the, we can purify the mind. It is possible to purify the mind. It is possible to, uh, to decrease and then eventually abandon anger, irritation, jealousy, envy, all those qualities that make our lives uh, un unhappy and uh, a lot of suffering. So that is a, but the, the point that the Buddha is talking about too is that if you, as I say, if you don't, um, if you don't realize that these uh, defilements are only visiting, they're, they're exterior to the mind, they're not in part of the mind. If you don't, if you don't realize that, you don't develop the mind. Why develop it? Most people actually they think, well, it's just as it is, and they don't do anything about it. But the Buddha is saying, if you think like that, you won't develop it. But if you realize, yes, the mind is in essential nature luminous, and these things are only visitors, really unpleasant visitors at that. Um, visitors you could well do without. <laughs> we could all well do without. If you realize that, then you can do something. Then you can develop the mind. And that's the beauty of the Buddha's teachings, that, that with these wholesome qualities and negative qualities, he taught us ways to reduce the negative ones, to, to develop the positive ones, and to uh, purify the mind totally, which is something that most people, they think, it's impossible, you know, I'm like this. And also they, think, they may think it's too much work. <laughs> so, but how do we develop the mind is, uh, is very uh, important. Actually, that's a, yeah, that's a good quote. In very important way because otherwise this is a very theoretical talk, it becomes, but the, the Buddha gave very clear ways that we can develop our minds. And everybody here knows those ways, I'm sure. And the first one was dana. You know, dana is giving. And often people... Uh, think of it as giving to monks and nuns, to we call sangha, and uh, that is good. But it's all giving. It's all giving, and it's not not just to uh, monks and nuns. It's to people, other people, our friends, people uh, in need. That's very nice when people um, help other people in need. And it's not only materially or with money. It's with. Uh, it's also with time, attention, kindness. Many different ways we can. Uh, uh, as it were, give to others. So it's important. And when we do this, actually, we are developing the mind. Uh, this is part of the practice, because the whole of the Buddha's practice for developing the mind, purifying the mind. And when we give to other people, what are we reducing? We're reducing that sense of selfishness, me first, <laughs> others much later, and uh, also stinginess, many, uh, many qualities like that. We've got to hold on to things, uh, you, you know, uh, we don't want to share with others, that sort of thing. So we're reducing those negative qualities that are in the mind. So this is part of training the mind to developing the mind. And the whole of the Buddha's path is really developing the mind. And... It's not only the negative side. When with dana, of course, it should uh, we should aim when we're giving to whoever to have a really uh, good mind state. We say joy in the mind. Be happy to give. You know, not to uh, not to have reservations and think, oh, maybe I shouldn't give. Or <laughs> to give wholeheartedly is 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 really something that can bring a lot of happiness and joy to us. And uh, in the Buddha's teaching, he says. We can use dana, what we've done, uh, you know, the things we have given to others. We can remember and we can use that to bring happiness into the mind for the meditation because medi uh, the meditation really flourishes when the mind is happy. If the mind is unhappy, it's, it, won't, it won't develop, actually, it won't develop. It's from happiness that we get the mind coming together in one place, in one spot and then developing wisdom. 
the mind like everyone else. If it's happy, it'll be happy to stay where it is and therefore be still, be peaceful, uh, calm. But if we, if the mind isn't happy, then it will go. It'll think about the past, the future, this and that. <laughs> it won't be happy to be here. So this dana, the happiness that we can get from dana, very important for our meditation too. The lovely thing with the Buddha's teaching, it all fits together. It's a bit like Lego. <laughs> It all comes together and everything joins in, supports other aspects of, of the path, of the practice. So the, the next and the most important part of uh, practice, what, what's that to people? No, no, no. Actually, I... I Sila, yeah. Sila is, Sila is a Pali word for our actions of body and speech. But it's also coming from our mind, from our mind. So it actually requires quite a bit of um, um, mind uh, work on the mind as well. And then we took the five precepts uh, earlier, and this is what uh, defines a practicing Buddhist: is the taking the five precepts and trying to live by them. You know, this is not necessarily having to be perfect with it, but. So in order to develop these precepts, we'd have to develop the mind too. We have to, um, as it were, have awareness of what we're doing. Because if we haven't got mindfulness of what we're doing, we'll, you know, we'll step on small insects, uh, um, maybe take things which uh, we're not sure who they belong to, and so on. We can break any of these precepts um, if we don't have mindfulness. But also, the precepts are, are like a minimum level. If we observe these, we refrain from harming living beings, we refrain from taking what's not given, we refrain from sexual misconduct, if we refrain from false speech, and if we refrain from alcohol and drugs that cloud the mind, this is a, like a minimum level. It protects us. The very important, sila is actually the, <laughs> in the path, I would say the most important thing. Because if we don't have this quality, if we don't have these... Uh, um, if we don't observe these precepts in our lives, then uh, we we are at risk. We're at risk. Sila is our insurance policy for happiness this life, let alone other lives. Because you know, if one if one's harming other beings, um, taking their property, um, uh, uh, also compromising their relationships, telling lies, and so on, one won't be popular in this life. <laughs> And won't be happy either. I think to a very large degree, it's on the mind. So these are these are important minimum standard for a, a happy life here and now and in the future. So, but it's not the only with seal. People think of it in this sense as a negative thing, but it's also a positive thing in the sense that you can um, develop instead of harming beings, you can develop lots of loving kindness and compassion for them. Dif their difficulties, all beings have difficulties, one sort or another, people, animals, insects, every, all beings. And also, like, instead of taking things, giving. Giving is, we talked about dana before and so on. So these things, are, we can develop the positive qualities as well and take them to the max. We, there's no limit to these qualities. And they will bring happiness to us, you know. When we, when we know, when we feel like the way we've acted and, s and spoken is, is good and we feel we've done our best, then, then we can be at peace with ourselves, quite happy with ourselves, you know. We've, we've done, done well. And the Buddha always said, you know, that when you keep precepts, you're also giving other beings a great gift because then they have freedom from fear. They don't have to worry that we're going to harm them, take their things, or whatever. So this is a gift we give to others. So the sense of um, a sense of worry, concern uh, that they may have, fear they may have, is is reduced greatly. So it's a real gift for them. And I say, if the world kept five precepts, it would be like heaven here on earth. It would be heaven. It would <laughs> truly. So and we'd have no very few problems. I think uh, it would be amazing. So that's uh, sila, and that, that's, uh, as I say, that is cultivating, is using the mind, because we need the mind to keep sila. We need the mind to develop those positive aspects of sila. But then, of course, 
uh, bhavana, they call it. Bhavana is cultivating the mind. And this is a broader term for the Buddha used. Cultivating the mind. In, in Sri Lanka, bhavana is synonymous with meditation. But in the Buddha's teaching, it's meditation is part of bhavana. Bhavana is cultivating or developing the mind. And there are many, we cultivate and develop the mind when we're doing giving, when we're keeping the precepts, the sila, uh, throughout the day, all the time, we can cultivate the mind. And how do we do this? Very simple. If we know of uh, uh, things that cause negative mind states to arise, we avoid them. If it's people or places, uh, people or situations, sorry, uh, we avoid them. Or if those mind states, negative mind states arise, we, we try to let go of them as best we can or reduce them. And the, thir- the third aspect is if we can develop positive mind states and this, this will bring us happiness and also avoid negative mind states. If you've got a positive mind state running in your mind, very difficult to get angry. If you've got a lot of loving kindness, somebody does something they shouldn't have, cut you off in traffic, said something they should, that's not pleasant, you, you may be a little irritated, but you won't be probably very angry if you've got loving kindness in the mind. And the last one the Buddha said, these are the four right efforts, <laughs> is to develop those wholesome states, maintain them, keep them going. And this will bring us happiness, you know. And uh, uh, so this is very, very useful for, for bhavana. And then, of course, the last, uh, the next thing, meditation, part of bhavana, actually. And this is when we directly work on the mind, develop sati, mindfulness, and we can develop loving kindness, all the different types of uh, meditation. We can develop samadhi from them. This is where the mind comes together. And then we uh, and then can go into deeper meditations like the jhanas, which are great, uh, incredibly blissful states of being that give rise to uh, insight, can give rise to insight. So this is what uh, those meditation is very good for. And one of my teachers, Ayakima, she would say one moment of, uh, well, she said concentration, but one moment of stillness is one moment of purification because the, the mind is not unwholesome. Because if the mind is uh, still, it's not negative. It's not. It's just still. And so one moment of uh, stillness is a moment of purification. And so this is what the aim of the, that, uh, the uh, tranquil meditation is, that to bring the mind together to reduce and eventually eliminate the defilements the negative qualities in the mind. And the, and the Buddha said this, this is what this is for, and then uh, it can lead to the liberation of the mind from the defilements. And then the other aspect that comes with that, of course, for meditation, once the mind is very still, very peaceful, it's, it's got the potential to see things in a different way, see deeply into things, and then wisdom can arise, can't it? And this is this is actually the aim of, of the Buddha's teaching. And this is where we can develop liberation through wisdom. There's two aspects of, of liberating the mind uh, from samsara. And this is where they, this also leads to our happiness, well-being, and also means that when we we deal with life in a different way, we deal with life in a wise way, a happy way, and not. Uh, not create more negative mind states uh, because we have the wisdom that knows that we are looking after our minds, that the, the things, the people outside of us, they can do and say what they wish, but they don't have to, won't necessarily impact on our minds. So in a perfectly enlightened person, no matter what people do and say to that person, they won't be unhappy, they won't be... Uh, um, angry, they won't react negatively, and this is this this is great happiness <laughs> because they're not at the they're in control of their own happiness in a sense. You know, they they're not disturbed by others. So, and uh, the other aspect, of course, of developing wisdom is to have right view. And this is a very very important part of. Um, developing the mind because if we have the wrong ideas about life if we have expectations about life that it should be like this like that uh, then the consequences are that we'll probably do and say things that are negative but if we have an idea that there's 
there are results from our actions in the speech, and if we have the idea that we will be reborn, that there are enlightened beings, then it changes the picture. Then it changes the picture. In actual fact, this is the, one of the most crucial th things in life because most people, they're running on a, an idea of reality that's not, we would say, not in accord with reality. And because of that, they, they, it leads to all, all sorts of problems uh, that they experience in their lives, you know, and developing negative qualities, maybe thinking that they're a good thing. Because <laughs> we now have people in the world who think killing other people is a good thing, <laughs> and so on. So this is definitely a wrong idea, wrong view. So we can develop right view. So I'd like to um, just finish there with just to encourage you to remember the blue sky. When you see the blue sky, if it comes out today, <laughs> <laughs> to remember that the mind is like that blue sky and it can be, we can develop that purity, we can remove the clouds and uh, all the uh, turbulent weather that exists below the, the blue sky and realize that purity of mind, we can develop that purity of mind which is uh, in accord with reality, totally in accord with reality, not, not in conflict and it is a very happy, pure state of being that can help not only ourselves, it's not just for us that we develop our minds, it's for other people too. Because if, you, if we are centered, if we are coming from a good place, uh, and we are peaceful, we are happy within ourselves, it affects others around us. And it's very interesting that you notice, you know, if, if people have, uh, like uh, sometimes people have grudges with each other, and, uh, you know, like they're not talking to, it happens in families, not talking to each other for years. If one person changes and lets go of that, a, a dyker, one of the supporters in Colombo is telling me it happened with her. She hadn't talked to her sisters for years and years. And, and then eventually she, she resolved it in herself. She came to peace within herself. She said, you know, it's okay. She didn't have to say anything to the others. And once she resolved in herself, then the, the sisters started talking to her again after all these years and years, and, that, and then now they're quite friendly because she made the move. Once she'd broken that, uh, that uh, gridlock, that, that pattern, then things change. So if we're coming from a good place, this is possible. You know, the people around us will be affected by that. Just as if someone's very angry, irritable, and uh, really angry, you can sometimes feel it when they come into a room. Just the body language, everything is very easy to, to detect. So let's, let us uh, develop the blue sky mind, a mind like blue sky, which is vast and pure and uh, wise and happy. So I'd like to finish there and I hope that's some uh, of some use to you, not too theoretical because so, uh, the whole point of it is to develop the mind, to develop the mind. And we can do that 24-7. It's not as if the mind is only here when we sit on cushions <laughs> or sit in this hall. And so uh, I encourage you to, to develop the mind. <laughs>